welcome one and all and it's a pleasure to have you all online with me today uh, if you've got your mic uh, on please would you just mute it uh, we'll have a session later on where it'll be an open mic session so and please during the webinar take the opportunity to type out your questions in the chat function on your right hand side of your screen if for any reason you can't easily see the slides when the control panel is up. Just click the two arrows and that will minimize the actual area there. So that will allow you to see the slides. So welcome one and all. We've got people from Seychelles and Africa and Sri Lanka, UK and UAE. Um, others may be joining later on, but I, I thank you for attending this session. This is the third in a series of six sessions that are being hosted by governance gurus during this time of COVID-19. We're taking the opportunity to give back and provide free training mini masterclasses. <clears throat> this session today is talking about the company secretary's guide for high performing boards. One of the key things to consider is how to add value in an organization. And that's before COVID, during COVID and post COVID. And I wish you all well and uh, good health. So recently I conducted a survey on LinkedIn just to find out about how empowered company secretaries are within their company. And I got quite a, a shock when I saw some of the answers. So the question, ah, so, uh, but before we get to that, we will touch on some of the areas of some of the things that have been said to me as an individual. So as when I first started my career as a company secretary, one of the senior managers of a, a, a large uh, accounting firm said to me, so what are you now? A typist who files his nails, which, was a, a, just showed ignorance in regards to what the role of the company secretary is and the value it can have. Uh, something I've had during the course of my career, I was told by a CEO, just do it. It doesn't matter what the delegation of authority says. And we'll explain more about some of these things later on in the webinar. I was told by a group CFO, you worry too much about governance, just like the non-executive directors. You all slow things down due to governance concerns are only there as a formality. That's a sad thing to be said, but unfortunately in some companies, this is the view that governance is a blocker rather than an enabler. I also had the pleasure of being told by my chairman that your role is to advise the board on governance. And if we go right or if we go left, you must always point us back to the middle. And one of the funniest things that I've uh, had said to me was from a non-executive director during a board meeting. And that was, Robert, there seems to be a fire. And surely enough, we had food uh, banquet on the side of the, at the board meeting and the paraffin burners underneath had actually started a fire within the food that was sitting there for the directors to eat because we had meetings all day and so i had to get up from my computer rush across to the other side of the room open a bottle of water and extinguish the fire so company secretaries have a very varied role now in the linkedin survey that i was talking about earlier uh, all participants are tasked with governance and all of them feel that they have to cover governance. But ironically, only 50% of participants felt that they had limited scope and empowerment, whereas only 42% said that they were empowered by the board. And 8% of participants felt that they were just there as a minute taker. And unfortunately, depending on the organization, and depending on the culture of the company and again depending on the actual country itself we've got varying levels 
of autonomy and empowerment as company secretaries. And one of the things that we have to consider as a company secretary is how do we build the confidence and trust to become trusted advisors, not just to the chairman, but also working with the board, whether they're executive directors, non-executive directors, or independent directors. And I've worked with various companies in my career. I've worked on portfolio companies. I've worked on AIM-listed companies. I've worked on listed companies. I've also been in the Middle East for 11 years, and I've had the opportunity to work and advise various companies, including large family businesses, as well as um, government entities and other businesses, small, medium-sized enterprises. And surprisingly, the governance and the structure varies across the various entities. And you'd be surprised sometimes at the lack or the focus on governance and the role of the company secretary. So I think today I'd like us to consider the value that if you're a board secretary or a company secretary, how do you add value to your board and how does that help the board become more effective and higher performing? The good news is that when you have a very organized professional company secretary that's had training and experience, they understand a lot of the dynamics in the board, outside of the board and the relationship between the shareholders, the board, and also with senior management. And it's very important to understand the industry that you're working in. So the role of the company secretary in governance excellence and high performing uh, boards, <clears throat> how do we add value? What should we do less of and what should we do more of? When I think about the things that we should do less of, number one, get involved in office politics, stay away from gossip, try and remain objective. Um, so we have to stay away from subjectivity and influence. Quite often people will try and influence us because we have the ear of the committees and the ear of the board. And so we have to pay less attention to what people are saying within the business from an executive side and also from a management side, because sometimes there is influence there to try and focus us when we're briefing and, and working with the board of directors. What should we do more of? One of the things that I've always said along the course of my career and when I've managed large teams and smaller teams, one of the things that I've said to my team members is get out and about and go and speak to people. If you're spending 95% of your time at your desk, sending emails and working on reports, this is the wrong focus for you to actually increase your presence and, and your uh, people's understanding of your competency and skill. Get out and about and go and speak to people. Go and find out what people do. Go and understand the business that you are helping the board have oversight on. Get a good relationship and spend time with understanding all of the, the chiefs within the, the business. So the chief human resource officer, the chief finance officer, the chief legal officer, the chief compliance officer, and also the chief risk officer, and definitely keep a relationship with the chief internal audit officer. These are very key people. Also have an understanding in regards to what IT is doing. So try and get close to the chief information technology officer because technology has become one of the strategic key focuses of boards in the last at least three years. And we're seeing that many boards don't have the chief uh, in information officer or anybody on the board with uh, the knowledge and experience relating to IT security, IT governance, data control, and also in regards to systems. 
one of the things that we have to understand is do the pr uh, policies and the procedures do they actually fit are they still relevant for the organization is the board getting full access so we have to understand and talk to people get out and about it's not about sitting at a desk yes we have to send emails yes we have to uh, go and uh, present at meetings maybe you're invited to the executive committee and some of the other management committees whatever it is you, that you're doing think about yourself as an ambassador for the board and an ambassador for governance and so whenever you're speaking or listening or present you have to understand that you are the representation of the board when you speak people listen and sometimes the things that you say you can influence or at least guide people and i can tell you various stories of how that can happen and the benefits of when management trusts you as an individual and as a professional when they see the the role that you play in regards to the fr smooth flowing of meetings and also getting approvals with the board and committees and so we want to try and keep people happy uh, we want to reduce the areas where there's potential conflict within the organization we want to understand the dynamics that are happening across the organization and so from this respect it's very important that we focus on ourselves and on our team speaking the right language saying the right words and using the terminology that's understood understanding the vision and the mission but also the core values of the business and upholding those and enhancing those as we go along the way quite often the company secretary is the unsung hero with the in the organization people don't see the work that they do before a committee or a board meeting or the work that's done after the board meeting the board meeting or the committee meeting is maybe for two or four hours and during that time the company secretary or the board secretary or the governance professional that's taking on that mantle will be calling people in to present they'll be helping with the whole flow of things and minuting the meetings as they go along they'll also be providing some updates in regards to some of the action points that have been given by the board to senior management and the responses by senior management back to either the committees and the board and this is where the company secretary really adds value because they're not just there as a postman it's not just the fact that management provide a report a presentation a proposal or a request for the board's approval and that the company secretary just puts it into the board pack and delivers it to the directors the company secretary has to read and understand what's in a board paper and what is it that people are asking for i remember at one organization where i was uh, advising the ceo of a particular entity uh, got one of his senior management team to call me and said Robert we need to present something to the board and so the individual told me please come down to our floor and we want to show you something so of course I went down I looked and on the table there were folders and binders full of procedures there was also a flow chart in regards to how procedures are implemented and it turns out that one of the objectives that was given to that entity CEO was that that entity CEO had to both get the policies and procedures in place but also implement those procedures in order to obtain one of their objectives for that particular entity and I asked the question why does this document why do these procedures need to go to the board of, of directors for approval 
and I got a lot of pushback saying we need the visibility these need to be approved by the board I said under your delegation of authority I can see that the approval of policies and processes for your particular entity only requires the signer from your own CEO and not from the board or the group CEO and so in this instance it was one of the times where I had to say no and push back and so one of the skills of a company secretary is being able to analyze data understand what the rules and regulations are within the organization and also understand what should and shouldn't go to the board of directors the board are very busy people if we think about how things are now during COVID-19 the uh, time of board are focused now on a lot of firefighting rejigging the strategy and the direction tweaking the business objectives and so the board's time is limited we have to utilize their time to make sure that the correct things are put onto the agenda for the board of uh, to consider from a risk management oversight and also from approvals point of view and at this point i would just pause and ask you what do you think are some of the key dilemmas or things that face the company secretary please feel free to type some of your questions in the uh, comment section and so from that respect we have uh, um, a focus some of you are saying that you can't hear sound at your end let me just double check why that would be And so from my side, everything seems to be fine. Just double check that your sound and everything is uh, updated. But from my side, are any other people facing any similar issues in regards to not being able to hear what I'm saying? Perfect. So I think... Uh, <clears throat> It looks like some of you are having technical issues, but sound is fine for most of the people that are in the, the session. Uh, one of the observations that have been provided is that some chairmen refuse to take governance advice. I think sometimes we have to consider the, the board and the chairman and their approach to governance and sometimes we don't necessarily have to approach it calling it as governance because quite often a chairman um, a director a ceo some of the c-suite they don't want to be told what to do and so we have to consider how we approach things in a realistic uh, manner and adapt our style one of the things uh, we can do more of is to be adaptable and agile think on our feet we have to be able to have a plan a and a plan b and and where possible have a plan c so from your respect um, when you're approaching the chairman uh, feel free <clears throat> to consider how you uh, address and look more towards what keeps them up at night how can you get the ear of the chairman Getting the ear of the chairman is not something that comes overnight, even when you're appointed into the role. And with the new ESCA regulations here in the UAE, uh, PSG, uh, pu public and private joint stock companies are required to have an independent company secretary. And so the reporting lines have changed as time has gone along. And so hopefully that answers the question that you have regarding uh, the chairman refusing advice. One of the things that I am, I'm working with someone at this present moment in time 
in regards to some areas <clears throat> and the advice that I've given is that sometimes the things that we say aren't initially accepted uh, or on the face of them they're not accepted but if we keep using the consistent language and we keep using the consistent terminology and we keep uh, representing good governance some of that really does <clears throat> come in and it starts coming into the language of directors of the senior management team and of board members and so we can influence from behind we don't have to be the smartest person in the room we should be the person that's got the highest level of emotional intelligence and we'll touch on some of those aspects a little later any other ways that you think that you as a board secretary or as a governance advisor or somebody that works with the board and senior management um, how you can add value just being in the company and managing the board's affairs that in itself is helping reviewing the corporate governance framework that in itself can be a way to add value and so when we think of governance I, I consider four main areas you have your shareholders who appoint the board and they appoint the auditors the board of directors that are the agents of the principals who are the shareholders and the board have oversight of the CEO and management and then you have your company secretary who is there as an objective independent person where possible and it's not always the case in every particular company and so the Chartered Governance Institute of the UK, the IC, formerly known as the ICSA, they defined corporate governance as the way that a company is governed and for what purpose. There has to be a purpose. Why is your company formed? It, all companies, commercial companies, are set up to, to make money. They have to make profit, they have to have add shareholder value, but there's other purposes that are set there. Maybe it's part of the vision and part of the mission the purpose so who has power who is accountable and who makes decisions this has to be formalized by way of board charter terms of reference delegations of authority and in the case of uh, Middle East we think uh, about powers of attorney quite often uh, powers are delegated through power of attorney so governance is not just something that happens at the board or shareholder level but it happens across the company and the whole aspect of governance is to make sure that processes and systems and controls are there to help an organization meet its objectives and that they should be looking in the context of society of regulations and also the market environment considering some of those macro risks and the emerging risks many companies didn't prepare and were not focused on how to um, mobilize once covid19 became a pandemic and this caught a lot of companies uh, on the back foot and so a lot of the time the company secretary can be trying to understand and present and guide and provide information and market intelligence to the senior executives as well as some of the board members. And so when we think about policies and procedures, those aspects are there as controls, but also so that people understand how and what decisions they can make, what authority they have. Lots of uh, family businesses and, and small, medium-sized enterprises they have owner and, and manager um, boards. And so the, ma the, the shareholders are actually the people running the, the business. And so from that respect, governance is, is a little bit different because they're focused on uh, generating revenue, trying to bring in potential new investors into the business and getting the business up and running. But one of the things that we have to consider when we think about governance is the wider stakeholders society 
and I mentioned at the last week's session about King 4 report and how that focuses on integrated reporting and the impact that companies have in regards to employing people locally, paying tax and the contribution to the community and the country that they are doing business in. And so when we think about what is an exemplary company secretary, what should it look like? I've put it into four particular categories and, and please, if, if you feel that there should be a fifth or a, a sixth or a seventh or an eighth, please feel free to put those in the comments and we can talk about those um, when we come to the end of the session. But I, I've always started it with the trusted advisor side of things because a company secretary needs to be focused in regards to becoming that person that gives wise counsel. When it's talking about objectivity, independent view of the truth, independent view of the truth or view of the truth is one of the things that comes up in enterprise risk management. And I think in our fifth session, we'll be covering <clears throat> enterprise risk management and how companies can embed risk management in their business. The whole aspect of a board and management is number one, to have risk oversight, number two, to put the policies and procedures and internal controls in place to allow people to do business and also to protect the business from potential inherent risks, principal risks, and also emerging risks. The whole aspect that the company can add, a uh, company secretary can add is when it comes to emotional intelligence. I'm not saying that IQ or intelligence is not uh, one of the key factors, but the company secretary also has to have an understanding and be able to read body language. A lot of things happen in meetings and it's easier to pick up on face-to-face -face meetings. Now a lot of the meetings are happening by way of video conference and webinars and so picking up on some of the nuances. So if you've got a board that are not dynamic, if you've got conflict at the board, you will not necessarily always see that remotely um, and it's more evident when people are meeting face to face. So we can add value by feeling and having intuition and also looking around the room, looking at the people as they speak, not just listening to what they say, but also looking at their body language and the other nonverbal prompts that are coming across when they're actually speaking. So if somebody's saying yes, but they're shaking their head or you, we, we know that psychologically, they actually don't believe the fact. Whereas if they're talking and they will shake their head and, and they're in, in agreement, but quite often you will see that even if you look on the international stage where you have leaders and people that are in government, even recently uh, I, I, I saw uh, a presentation by some uh, one of the ministers in, in, in the UK talking about something and they were asked a question and the word said yes, but they were shaking their head. So there was very probably a negative uh, aspect that they were considering and they didn't 100% believe they were given the right answer for the, the question, but it wasn't necessarily uh, the full truth. And then of course, as company secretaries, we have to be technically up to date. How much do we know the company procedures? Do we know the regulations that, the, that govern the company? Are we aware of the roles and responsibilities and the fiduciary duties of the directors, whether that be um, here in the Middle East or internationally? Because quite a lot of companies have got an international footprint and where companies have an international footprint, quite often those directors or even sometimes the senior executives are appointed into subsidiary or joint venture boards and there people need to understand what their legal obligations are and also having meetings, when to have meetings, where to have meetings and how to have meetings 
because one of the things that you don't want to do is when you've got a group structure that's been set up to be tax efficient, you don't want to be uh, putting the company, the whole group, into a tax position through a permanent establishment or through some other aspects in regards to substance. And so where the meetings are held and uh, the frequency of meetings, these are things that we need to consider as a company secretary, adding value to the company. And so what does a company secretary look like? Well, I, these images show us that there is no face there, but company secretary is meant to have a lot of ideas, a lot of knowledge and a lot of understanding. One of the things that happens for <clears throat> businesses is that they will, uh, people within the organization, including non-executive directors and the independent directors, they will come to us and ask us questions. And that's how it focuses in on us becoming the trusted advisor, how we are the ones that provide that independent view of the truth. We have to say things as it is, but also we have to be very wise. We are in a very privileged position as a company secretary. We see a lot of the paperwork um, that is going out to the board of directors and all of the committees. And a lot of the executive directors, um, including the CEO, is not necessarily privy to the information that is going, for instance, to the audit committee. And so from that respect, we have a lot of knowledge and a lot of power because knowledge can equal power, but we have to use that wisely, know what to say when, and sometimes we have to play dumb. And you might say, Rob, you're crazy. Why should we play dumb? Because quite often if someone asks us the question and we give a yes or a no to the question, we've alerted that particular individual to the focus either at the committee or at the board. And it's okay for us not to answer a question if it's not relevant. And so I'll give you a very brief uh, example. Somebody came into my office and was asking about bonuses and pay rises. And they said they had heard that there was going to be the announcement of bonus and pay rises within the organization and that they had heard that it was going to be uh, a, quite a high percentage. And so how did I answer that question? I answered that question with another question. And that question was, who told you that? And at that point, the person ended the conversation and, and left the office. It hadn't been presented to the board. They were trying to fish and understand what was the board's focus what paperwork was going to the board. And so in those respects, we have to be bold and actually call people out. We don't have to answer every question that's asked of us. And we have to be wise about what we do say and what we don't say. The other thing that I used to do was have a whiteboard on my wall and people would quite often come into my office and have general conversation. And then they would be looking across the the, the room looking at what papers are on my desk. And so quite often I would write information on the, the whiteboard that would confuse them. So they would come in, they would come for a purpose of trying to understand what's happening at the next meetings. They would look at the whiteboard, they would see some text or some diagrams, and it, it, they would then look and wonder, I don't understand what this is. And, and so this is a distraction tactic. You might say, why did you do that? It really did help in regards to keeping people away from what I was doing. And one of the practices that I would have if I was working on anything and someone came in to the office, I would turn my papers the other way. Of course, my, I had an open door policy, but there were times when I was working on highly confidential information and those were not to be uh, shared with anyone. Were there any questions? Is that all making uh, perfect sense? I don't see any additional questions that have been put into the, the chat uh, area. And so we have to know ourselves. what are our strengths and what are our weaknesses? 
when we're building a company secretariat team or we're advising we have to get the right people around us because we can't be strong in every area and every aspect when it comes to uh, management and governance and also understanding everything and so utilize your team have players and people that understand different aspects that can add value and strengthen your position as an advisor and also keep up to date and allow others task others within your team empower others get people to think outside of the box and come up with solutions allow people within your team to have independent thought and develop that that in, uh, curiosity that in, inquiry and going along those ways and so we think of the traditional model of corporate governance and the role that the company secretary plays we've got the shareholders the board the ceo reports into the board in this region in some of the entities ceos are not sitting on the board of of directors and they may not necessarily be called a ceo they might be called a managing director or a general manager and so that was the company secretary as well when we think of the company secretary their role definitely they are appointed into the board um, and by the board uh, in many companies but relationship wise in MENA itself Middle East and North Africa quite often the company secretary will report as a straight line into the CEO rather than as uh, a direct report into the board of directors and the CEO is tasked with risk management on a day-to-day -day basis they're there helping implement the strategic directions and the business objectives across the organization and so there's various committees and these are just a few that might be there depending on the type of company <clears throat> if you're thinking in the financial services and banking sector there definitely needs to be um, a risk uh, management um, uh, committee and a separate audit committee because time needs to be focused on risk management and unfortunately boards don't have a lot of uh, time on their agenda to look at some of the high risks the medium risks and, and some of the lower risks uh, at the entity levels but they will only look at the group um, aspects of the heat map relating to the top 10 or top 20 key risks for the group but some of those aspects that are happening in subsidiary companies could very quickly emerge into high risk for the group and so the CEO is supported by an executive committee and that executive committee can be made up of various chief executives so the chief human resource officer and I've put the lines here in grey where the person or the individual may be reporting in to the CEO and then into the the committees in the various aspects the chief internal audit officer should be of independent thought and reporting and generally will be reporting direct line into the audit committee and having a dotted line into the CEO in the same way that the company secretary does that they are reporting administratively to the CEO but effectively their direct line is to the governing body that sits above the CEO and so when we think of the value there how that model works we then have to consider the aspects of how does the company secretary add value to the board how do they make the board perform better and we've touched on some of the elements as we've gone along and and through the session and so from that respect we have to understand the company we have to understand the individuals the characters the drivers ceos are very strong characters they're very uh confident they are tasked with a lot of uh responsibility and a lot of the onus sits on their shoulders and so they have to have broad shoulders and, and strong backs and so they're focused on quick wins and quite often the information that comes from the chiefs into the exec, uh, executive committee and then from the CEO is filtered into the board of directors and so the company secretary has to be able to 
read between the lines and this is where they can help the executive and non-executive and the chair focus on some of the aspects of how they discharge their fiduciary duty and also <clears throat> how management can align with the objects uh, that the company and the board has set as well as the core values. We have to always think about vision and, and mission and core value and we and from that respect it's one of the big challenges that the company secretary has because they're not classed as part of senior management because they're independently reporting to the board the board are the ones that appoint them and remove them the board and potentially the remuneration committee are the ones looking at the company secretary's remuneration package bonus and other um, uh, benefits and so I put together what I, I feel is the, the main areas of, of the corporate governance framework. And the, the company secretary is the one that on an annual basis is looking at the aspects. Are these still relevant? Are they still in line with the policies and procedures? Do certain things need to be reviewed and presented to the committees and the board to get uh, amendment or additional information added into those policies? And so when we think about the vision, it's looking at the long term, but also we have to consider the mission. And so we have to consider the short and the, the medium term. Our mission and the business objectives are what leads us towards the long term sustainability and success of the organization. Lots of companies during this period have gone out of business. Many companies have made people redundant. And as company secretaries, we need to be adding value on a day-to-day -day basis, whether it's working with the management team, whether it's reviewing policies and, and procedures, or advising the independent and non-independent uh, um, non-executive directors and helping advise and, and guide the management of what the board is expecting within board packs, having an executive summary and other aspects. And so the value should be aligned and the business objectives should be achieved through applying the values that are in the organization and what's expected in the business. And we think about the cultural aspects. These are the aspects of what's really done in practice. The group think, or do we have a culture of fear? Do we have a culture of openness? Are we adopting what is required or are we just merely box ticking for the purposes of regulatory or legal compliance? And of course, we have to consider the aspects of employee engagement. One of the things that businesses do, and I've done some work with some of the Ethiopian banks, there they have a percentage of their, their profits or revenue that has to be uh, used every year to train and develop staff across the business and this is a great initiative having training and, and develop not just for the board not just for senior management but across the business and allowing people to have access to fresh information new ideas and this helps with employee engagement but a company has a, a purpose and it has to align with the values of the particular organization. And so we have, as a company secretary, we have to ensure and try and, and guide to make sure that people are doing things according to the values and the, the what's expected. What is the tone from the top? We want someone to say and we want someone to do. And when we have effective boards, they are saying and doing all of the right things. They are being role models they're being examples and they're being pace setters in regards to leadership, direction and being agile as well. And of course, work environment. Now companies are really having to focus on how they look at the aspects of the, the work environment. Many businesses have already said that they will not go back to the uh, bricks and mortar way of doing things. Some of the law firms here in this region Many of the lawyers and the support staff and employees, they are actually working 
effectively from home. There's certain businesses that people don't necessarily need to be in the office. Now, from my point of view, things are always easier face to face and it's a little bit more difficult to do things and challenging. Not everyone is up to speed when it comes to technology and how to do things and the way to do things. And so as a company secretary, we can add value here by understanding the technology and taking the time to walk people through and having trial runs and test runs to make sure that before meetings, everyone is aware of which buttons to press, how to mute themselves, how to turn on the camera, when to um, uh, speak, introducing themselves. <clears throat> and so the way that company secretaries at this present moment in time, they're having to adapt how they go about recording the meetings because it's a challenge if people don't introduce themselves before speaking and if people have very similar accent um, or tone of voice sometimes uh, it will be hard to capture who said what and put that into the minutes and so some of the big areas that have come up um, and ICSA and uh, uh, um, I think it's the Governance Institute or Board of Board Intelligence did some, some, some research looking at some of the key aspects that the directors feel that are giving them problems when it comes to decision making. And the key areas are that uh, there's too much uh, time is put into reading the board pack. They are too long. And then if we look at the other one, they're too operational as well as they are too internally focused and hard to extract key messages. One of the things that we can do to help our board and to help senior management is to provide guidance in regards to the format of how papers and information should be presented. If it can't be concisely put into three pages and then have the details behind for further reading, it means that it's very unlikely that the person presenting the, the paper to the board understands what they're presenting. The board don't want somebody to come to the meeting and read off the slides A, B, C. They want to come, they will have read uh, the board pack. If they've got questions, they'll have already noted those questions. The person coming to present at the meeting needs to be there with impact. The board and the committees have limited time. So let's utilize that time. Let, let us focus senior management on respecting the time of the board so that they focus on the key aspects that are relating to the business. And so late papers is the biggest uh, challenge that directors have. There's no, if you're making really serious decisions, you want to get board papers in advance. And a lot of times, quite often management are required to try and get things through to try and allow them to meet their objectives for that particular year and so quite often they'll try and push things in the agenda at the last board meeting of the, the year and so the company secretary has to be able to manage these aspects and make sure that papers are relevant and at the same time allow the business to get on with the business that they need to do. It also touched on the average of uh, board meetings based on revenue and also the type of industry. So quoted companies and, and private companies on average held the same amount of meetings during the course of the year. A staggering 5% of companies have board packs of 351 to 500 pages long and 1% uh, uh, of the, the, the companies that were interviewed have board packs of over 800 pages. So these are big challenges. If the board packs are too big, too much information is being presented to the directors, it makes it very difficult for them to make informed decisions and prepare for meetings if the board packs are sent to them late. And so the role of the company secretary, quite often it is a lonely role. You've got a lot of information and a lot of knowledge. Um, sometimes management feel that you're the spy of the board or the committees. So they don't necessarily, they're not open to you or they don't share information uh, with you in, in the correct manner. 
they always feel that, that you're the one chasing them in regards to where are they in, in regards to directives and actions that have been assigned to them and at the same time you're not able to share the things that you know outside of your particular team maybe there's redundancies afoot maybe there's going to be across the board uh, short-term pay cuts maybe a whole division will be sold um, or disbanded and these are the aspects that you'll know in advance of some of the other people and so it's a challenge from your point of view and psychologically you have to prepare yourself that not everyone will like you not everyone will listen to you and from that respect it can be lonely as a company secretary but focus on the value that you can add and understand that company secretaries worldwide feel exactly the same way as you and do speak to your peers outside of your company not about confidential information but sometimes of the emotional and uh, the other aspects of <clears throat> getting uh, uh, positive feedback and being able to embed yourself within the business. Becoming a trusted advisor doesn't happen overnight. People need to see that you are competent, that you are independent, and that you're also trustworthy. And as they see these things, and they see that you're not just saying something for the purpose of blocking, but you're acting as a conduit for enabling people, then it will become less lonely because people will speak to you more openly. I've written a, a, a blog, and if you want to take the time, you can look under the blog section on the Governance Guru's uh, website. I talked about my experience as a company secretary, a governance professional, and also uh, where I've acted as a, a board director. So we've got three more four, uh, webinars. So next Wednesday, we'll be looking at the Agile approach to strategic goals and business objectives. On the fifth session, we'll be looking at enhanced uh, emotional intelligence for more influence. And on the final session, we'll be looking at building the optimal enterprise risk management culture. Why is that important? How will that affect the, the, the overall performance of the company and getting synergy between the shareholders, the board and senior management, and then cascading that down throughout the business? And so that brings us to the end of this session. And I wanted us now to spend a little time. Um, and if there's any questions, uh, please feel free to type those into the <coughs> chat. Or if uh, uh, you want to open mic, please feel free to use that. Rob, I have a question. This is uh, Paul DeBauer here. Yes, hi Paul. Hi Rob. Um, thanks very much for that. I, I wanted to check with you, given the the uh, positioning of the company secretary, the corporate secretary, in relation to the board and the executive management team, have you come across, you talked about emotional intelligence and how important that is, have you come across these situations where there's a tension, shall we say, in the relationship between the CEO and say the board chair or the board of directors generally and how as a, as a secretary can we overcome that conflict because essentially we have this sort of reporting line to both both parties and obligations to both parties but at the same time we have to respect their um, confidences and, and things that they say to us how can we overcome that sort of dilemma Rob any thoughts on that uh, th yeah, I do have some thoughts and I've definitely got some experience firsthand of that. Uh, we have to be independent and provide independent thought and the relationship uh, at least between the chair, the CEO and the company secretary should be a, a strong one. It's a, a, a triangle of sharing and in the organisational chart I, I, I showed, um, we see the board, the CEO and the uh, the company secretary. Now, oftentimes, 
the CO is meant to be fully autonomous and, and empowered to implement the directions of the board and the decisions that are made. But quite often, depending on who the chair of the, the company is and who the directors are on the board, they will sometimes get involved in some of the operational risk management day-to-day -day aspects of the business. And in regards to the role of the company secretary, it's working independently with the CEO and independently with the board, talking about roles and responsibilities, what is at the strategic level and also what is at the operational level, because the focus for the CEO is on the strategic implementation and achievement of business objectives. And from that respect, the board should allow the CEO to do what they've been asked and empowered to do. The, the analogy I, I give is that the, the board is giving directions and the chairman is a passenger in the vehicle that the CEO is driving because effectively the board are not driving the the company it's the CEO and their team on a day-to-day -day basis so the board through the chairman uh, or chairwoman will provide the strategic direction to say um, Mr. CEO or, or Mrs. CEO I want you to drive from Dubai to Abu Dhabi and we want you to drive there on by X time. Now, the chairman shouldn't be spending their time telling the, the CEO what speed to drive, which roads to take, when to leave, um, uh, when to fill up with petrol. These are aspects that a CEO should be uh, allowed to, to do, but the CEO, um, as a passenger in that vehicle. So when the car is driving, the chairman or the board have an emergency brake that's in that vehicle, in the company, so that when they see that either the CEO is, is breaking the rules um, or doing things that are not according to the core values, uh, that the, the board or the chair has the opportunity to step on the, the emergency break and get involved. But other than that, the chairman or the chairwoman should allow the CEO, who is paid, generally speaking, in most companies across the world, significantly more than, than, than the chairman, allowing them to do what they've been brought in to do to give the company that positioning uh, for excellence and uh, meeting its business objectives. Does that answer your, your question? Yeah, that's that's very helpful, Rob. I, I think you're right. It's it's one of those issues where there, there's a, a fine balance to be had and understanding the independence uh, of uh, the secretary. Um, very, very important in the role. But no, thank you. And I, I, one of the things that I personally have had to do is some things have been said to me from the CEO that I c couldn't repeat to the, the chair and things were said from the chair that I couldn't repeat to the CEO and, and that's why I go back to that whole aspect of um, wisdom, speaking wisely, but also having the intelligence, the emotional intelligence of what the person is feeling and why they feel in relation uh, to that particular feeling. And so I'll give you one very brief example. Um, I worked with a new uh, CEO who had come into the organization and they were saying, how does the board operate? We had gone through the, the whole induction process. I talked about the board. I then talked about other stakeholders that were very important uh, to get engagement from. And so from that respect, um, they were asking, how should we do things? If you were me, what would you do? And I, I, I said, look, I wouldn't want to be in your uh, position, it being a, uh, uh, a, a CEO or a group CEO is a very challenging position when you're coming into a well-established organization with a, a very mature board. And so I talked about getting buy-in and understanding and, and, and presenting and, and providing the information that was required 
and what was expected by the board, but also having conversations and trying to spend time getting to know the chairman of the board, the chairman of the various committees, as well as other stakeholders and people with influence. And after the very first meeting, the CEO, a group CEO attended, they were very dejected and, and they called me into their office and they said, Rob, why, why is it that the board rejected all of my proposals, everything that everything I put forward, everything was rejected? And I, I asked one simple question, did you reach out to the various stakeholders uh, that we discussed in the course of the induction? Did you take the time to let people understand and uh, align their mind of what you're trying to achieve and how that fits within the objectives of the organization? And the answer to that was no. And then going forward for each committee or, or board meeting where they were present, they then prepared, they spoke to the relevant stakeholders, they looked for um, guidance in regards to board papers, presentations, and the information that directors. And so that's how I, as, as, a, as a board secretary and a company secretary and governance advisor to the, the chairman, was able to help work with the group CEO to align them to what the board was expecting and how it should be presented. I've got another few questions here. Do you think the board should have a majority of non-executive directors to improve governance and challenge to executive management? That's a very good question. Having non-independent uh, or non-executive directors definitely does help the challenge but there's various things that we need to, to consider number one is how much are those non-executive directors being paid and is that their only particular role because if that's their only role they don't necessarily act fully independently they're focused on trying to keep that uh, board position in listed companies, there should be uh, a majority of non-executive uh, directors and people appointed as independent directors. But from that, that being said, an independent director can actually turn to non-independent even at the very first board meeting. And so funnily enough, I was doing a presentation in Malaysia um, to a, a large group of, of directors and during that particular uh, training um, one of the directors there had been an independent director for decades I mean decades uh, he was the oldest person in the room and other people within the the room said how can you be independent when you've been with the company for so long and how he explained was it was an independence of thought yes he had been on the board for many years but he still challenged management did uh, present different arguments and because he understood the business of the company he was able to then point to certain things that happened in the past of the history and provide independent thought and so the whole mechanism in, in Malaysia with the Malaysian code of corporate governance there, people have to, um, there's a certain period of, of independence. After that, they have to get approval on an annual basis that they are remaining um, independent. But definitely my impression, my, my gut feel was that particular individual was definitely willing to challenge management's uh, decisions and also look at the aspects uh, relating to independent thought because they were worried about the overall objective uh, for the business. Also, they were looking at the brand um, and the company's positioning. And for themselves as an individual, they were concerned about their reputation as well being tarnished by not challenging. And so independence can be very quickly lost and it can remain for a lot longer, but definitely within financial organizations that whole area of independence drops away after a period of of nine years those directors can still remain on the board 
but they then drop back to being non-executive directors but there does need to be a large proportion of independent non-executive directors hopefully that answers that question i've got another one here uh about uh, co the comment uh, about the relationship between the, the cosec and the chairman and the and the, and the ceo um uh and they they're, they're talking about uh, uh we are in a difficult situation in our organization organization because our immediate past CEO became chairman of the board. Now that particular instance is a big challenge and in many uh, countries and for listed companies it's actually against the, the rules and, and regulations. Um, the CEO shouldn't become the chair. What is the, the purpose of the, the chairman of the board? I mean we could spend a whole day just talking on the roles and responsibilities within um, an organization. But it's very dangerous for the CEO to become the chair, especially if they still keep that executive uh, position. Number one, when that person is chair, people won't necessarily, even if there's a new CEO put in place, people won't necessarily go to the new CEO. They will actually bypass and jump above the CEO to go and speak to the chair because the chair has knowledge and information. It's also blurring the lines of roles and responsibilities. Um, that being said, um, if we look at the US model of corporate governance, uh, there uh, around 50% of the S&P 500 companies still have a combined role of, of chairman and CEO. But if we look back at the case study I gave uh, briefly at the last session about Wells Fargo. Wells Fargo had a, uh, John Stumpf was the chairman and the CEO of the business and so he was giving presentations and reports and and uh, but at the same time he was governing and it, the chair whether it's a chairman or a chairwoman they are meant to be guiding and providing leadership to the board and providing independent challenge to the board. So from that respect, it actually becomes very difficult. I'm not saying it's the wrong or, or, or right solution for your organization, because each company is different and the way that they perform and handle things is different. Were there any last questions before we brought the session to a close? And hopefully I've covered off most, if not all of the questions. Ah, okay. I've been asked uh, um, uh, 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 a question um, here. If we consider the board's role and how they actually go about oversight, um, should they be dropping down and asking for more information? It's the board's right to ask the company to provide uh, more information and to prove if we look at uh the recent uh, uh uh fraud or or potential accounting fraud that's taken place in wirecard um there's suddenly a, a gap on the balance sheet of uh, of around two billion pound and we've seen other aspects of this happen um here in, in uae um with Abraj Capital um, uh, and other organizations. If we look back to the story of Toshiba, Toshiba had three CEOs who respectively hid uh, losses uh, for a, a large period of time, which was then discovered. And uh, Toshiba at the time um, was the ninth highest performing governance entity listed company in Japan and after the announcement they were actually removed from the list and many staff were, um, were were made redundant certain business lines there was large staff cuts and then from a reputational point of view it's something that's very difficult to recover from and so the whole aspect of the and people always blame the external auditors so right now 
Um, I believe it's EY that's the auditor for uh, Wirecard. And in the past, there's been other um, cases where uh, if we look at Carillion and, and, and Abrage and, and, and others, where the auditors uh, have, the regulators have said, where is the auditor? But the scope of the audit and what the audit, uh, the inter external auditor does, their scope is actually very narrow. Yes, they're meant to provide, they are relying on management to provide them with the information that they've requested. And the one thing that happens within organizations as part of the audit sign-off is the external auditor asks management to provide a management representation letter that says all of the information provided is correct and that to the best of their knowledge, nothing has been hidden, there's no areas of fraud. And so that's almost like a, a get out of jail free for boards, uh, for external auditors. Now, the question is, my question is not so much about the external auditor, because the external auditor is only coming in uh, to look at aspects on an annual basis. My question would be, where was the finance team in this respect? And also, more importantly, where was the internal audit function and why did they not, from their review and their audit plan across the, the number of years, why did they not discover that there was a potential uh, aspect of um, fraud or hiding bad debt? Hopefully that answers that, uh, that question. Were there any last questions before we close for today? Please feel free, open your mic and, and ask it, um, or you can type it into the, the chat function. But it's been a, a, a great time. Hopefully um, you'd have taken something away from this session and from my respect um, this time is not enough for us to really to do a deep dive this is more of a high level bite-size mini masterclass but we could spend days talking on on various aspects of this and how the company secretary how the board can perform at a higher level so with that I would uh, wish you all a good day uh, stay safe. If there's anything that you need or there's any questions that you didn't want to ask during this session, please feel free to drop me an email or get in touch. Um, you can send uh, something through from the uh, through the company website, going to the contact us section, or if you've got my mobile or all my uh, email address, please feel free to contact me directly. And with that, I would wish you all. Um, good day and thank you very much for attending today's session.